Could this new hydrogel make HIV therapy more convenient? For people with HIV, statins show 35% drop in heart attack risk. Heterosexual HIV infections overtake gay and bisexual cases in this country. Another country is close to zero new HIV infections. Ex-rugby star Gareth Thomas on relentless abuse after coming out as gay and HIV positive. Man pleads guilty to distributing fake HIV drugs. I'm Raif Durazi, and these are some of the topics from our weekly roundup of the latest HIV news for the week of September 25th through October 1st. I've got 18 articles to cover, a whopping 18 articles. If you want access to all the complete articles, all links will be available in the description box below this video. And I've got a special opportunity for those interested in being a peer educator in HIV, which I'll share at the end. And now for the news. Number one, pink news. Heterosexual HIV infections overtake gay and bisexual cases in Scotland. New statistics reveal a 13% increase in new HIV diagnoses among straight people in Scotland since 2019, continuing a trend observed throughout the UK. In 2020, straight individuals accounted for almost half, 49% of all new HIV diagnoses in England, surpassing the proportion for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. However, GBMSM, gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men, have experienced a 37% decline in new HIV diagnoses in Scotland since 2017, attributed to successful interventions like pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, and accessible HIV testing. To further combat HIV transmissions, the Terence Higgins Trust urges the Scottish government to increase HIV testing and improve PrEP accountability. Similar goals have been set in England to end new HIV transmission by 2030, but experts question the likelihood of achieving this without expanding opt-out HIV testing programs across the UK. And opt-out HIV testing means that the patient is notified that HIV testing will be performed unless the patient declines. How many findings like this do we have to uncover before people stop calling this a gay disease? Clearly it's not. Number two, AIDSFONS.org. Amsterdam, close to zero new HIV infections, the Netherlands is next. Amsterdam is making significant progress toward zero new HIV infections with a 95% decline in new cases since 2010. In 2022, only nine people reportedly contracted HIV in the Dutch capital. This achievement aligns with the international UN AIDS target for 2030, indicating that 98% of people with HIV have been diagnosed, 95% of those aware of their status are receiving treatment, and 96% of those on treatment have suppressed the virus making transmission unlikely. Amsterdam City Council's political commitment and additional funding, especially for the HIV prevention drug PrEP, contributed to this remarkable progress. The success was announced at the Fast Track Cities Conference in Amsterdam, emphasizing the need for similar commitment across the Netherlands. Number three, The Hill. GOP faces pressure to reauthorize key HIV initiative held up by anti-abortion Republican. The ongoing saga that is Reauthorizing PEPFAR, or the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, is something I've continued to cover. Pressure is increasing for the GOP majority House to reauthorize the U.S.'s long-term global HIV initiative, PEPFAR, but Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, Republican, is hindering the legislation. Former President George W. Bush, who initiated PEPFAR in 2003, urged Congress to pass a five-year reauthorization emphasizing the program's pro-life impact that has saved over 25 million lives. Activist groups like Housing Works occupied Speaker Kevin McCarthy's office, urging action on PEPFAR and domestic HIV AIDS funding. Number four, the conversation. HIV self-test kits are meant to empower those at risk, but they don't necessarily lead to starting HIV treatment or prevention. HIV self-test kits were developed to enhance testing accessibility, yet research reveals that many users don't subsequently seek necessary HIV treatment or start pre-exposure prophylaxis prep for prevention. Although HIV self-testing increased the likelihood of finding an HIV clinic by 8%, significant number don't initiate treatment or prep. Female sex workers using self-test kits were 47% more likely to seek medical care, but this didn't reduce the number of clients they saw per night. Among men who have sex with men, self-testing might increase condomless anal sex, potentially contributing to HIV spread. The study underscores 
the need to understand why individuals don't seek care post self-testing, aiming to develop interventions and contribute to ending the HIV epidemic by 2030. I thought it was interesting that though the article was tracking whether people went on to incorporate HIV prevention and or treatment after using HIV self-test kits, and then also lumped that together with effects on the number of sexual partners engaging in anal sex with a condom and frequency of condom use. The statement about sex workers seeking medical care but didn't reduce their nightly clients like do you expect them to work less now that they're taking care of themselves um the research i i feel is a bit stigma laden i don't think it was intentional but but nevertheless i see it it's like yay sex workers are seeking treatment more but they're still working just as much uh, too bad maybe if they cut their daily starbucks coffee they wouldn't have to see as many johnnies per night same goes for the gay, bisexual, men who have sex with men comment. Okay, so they're testing more and therefore more confident about their sexual health and therefore having more sex. Y yay. Uh, oh, no? Okay. No, that's bad. Okay, for shame. Um, instead of calling this out, why not focus on the need to emphasize the use of PrEP and or PEP as options to protect your own sexual health and talking to your sexual partners about their status and what about you equals you? All those things... Um, but the verbiage in the article kind of um, automatically assumed that having more condomless sex or sex workers continuing to have as many clients per night was an automatic negative thing, hence the stigma. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to tap that like button. Number five, attitude. Ex-rugby star Gareth Thomas on relentless abuse after coming out as gay. Quote, I was subjected to so much shit, end quote. Former Welsh rugby player Gareth Thomas, now participating in Celebrity SAS, Who Dares Wins, the reality show, revealed the extensive abuse he faced after publicly coming out as gay in 2009 and disclosing his HIV positive status. Thomas, 49, shared the challenges he endured, including being subjected to derogatory comments during matches and facing blackmail related to his HIV status a decade later. Despite the adversity, he expressed his refusal to be a victim and highlighted the misconceptions surrounding HIV, emphasizing that it doesn't limit his physical and mental capabilities. Thomas, a patron of the Terence Higgins Trust, has been actively involved in LGBTQ plus charities. Number six, Washington Post. For people with HIV, statins show 35% drop in heart attack risk. New research published in the New England Journal of Medicine suggests that taking a daily cholesterol lowering statin could reduce the risk of cardiovascular issues in people living with HIV by as much as 35%. I covered this story before when it was announced at the International AIDS Conference, but here we are again, I think it's important. The study involving 7,769 adults on antiretroviral therapy found that those taking a statin, specifically pitavastatin, for about five years saw a 30% reduction in bad LDL cholesterol. Additionally, individuals with HIV on a statin were 21% less likely to die from cardiovascular problems. The findings apply specifically to pitavastatin, but researchers suggest that other statins might have similar effects, cautioning about potential interactions with antiretroviral therapy. The American Heart Association notes that people with HIV face up to twice the risk of cardiovascular problems compared to the general population. Number seven, Vice News. It's way too hard for black women with HIV AIDS to get the pain relief they need. Esther Ross, a resilient advocate for individuals living with HIV AIDS, reflects on her enduring struggle with persistent pain despite significant advancements in medication. Although she now stands undetectable for the HIV virus due to cutting edge drugs, obtaining adequate pain relief proved to be a formidable challenge. Doctors frequently minimized her pain, attributing it to factors such as age, stress, or menopause. This article delves into the profound historical roots of medical racism, shedding light on biases stemming from experimental surgeries on enslaved black women. These biases persist, contributing to the systemic undertreatment of pain experienced by black individuals. The recently enacted No Pain Act, designed to improve pain treatment, may fall short in addressing these entrenched disparities given the enduring legacy of medical racism. The No Pain Act, approved by Congress in 2022, aims to address opioid-related deaths by incentivizing non-opioid pain relief. 
The article highlights the challenges faced by these patients, including difficulty accessing opioid narcotics for pain relief due to increased awareness of opioid addiction and prescribing guidelines. Number eight, Southern Min. Billy Porter has survivor's guilt over living with HIV. Billy Porter, the 53-year-old singer and actor, opened up about his experience living with HIV since 2007, expressing a sense of survivor's guilt for enjoying a full life amidst the advancements in HIV treatment that previous generations didn't have. Initially grappling with shame, he now sees his role as part of a generation breaking barriers. Porter feels a responsibility to speak out for his generation and educate younger ones about acceptance, love, and unity. His album, quote, The Black Mona Lisa, aims to convey messages of support and acceptance, emphasizing the importance of artists using their voices, especially in challenging times, to contribute to the healing of civilizations. Number nine, Metro Weekly. Man pleads guilty to distributing fake HIV drugs. Armando Herrera, a Miami man, has pleaded guilty to distributing over 16.7 million of adultered HIV drugs in a scheme orchestrated with Lazaro Roberto Hernandez. The counterfeit operation involved acquiring genuine pills from Gilead, repackaging them in used bottles collected from vulnerable individuals, and selling them with altered components. The pills were distributed through companies set up in multiple states in the U.S. with false documentation to appear legal. The drugs reached pharmacies, ultimately affecting patients living with HIV. Gilead Sciences had previously warned about knockoff versions of HIV medications in 2021. Herrera faces up to five years in prison for conspiracy to introduce adulterated drugs into interstate commerce. The article states, quote, Herrera and his co-conspirators were alleged to have adulterated or mislabeled at least 16,050 tablets of the HIV medication Truvada, 3,690 tablets of the HIV medication Bictarvi, and 7,341 tablets will put into a bucket called Other Pills. So folks, let this be a warning to you not to go and seek medication from alternative sources when you can get it from your doctor or from a certified um, healthcare clinic, etc. Even though some of these pills, it appears, were able to work their way into the legal system, I'm sure those people have been since notified. Whereas if you're just getting it off market from who knows your neighbor, Bob, um, there's no way of knowing either way. So keep an eye on that. Number 10, the healthy. Magic Johnson exclusive, I needed to become the face of HIV, he said. In a recent interview, basketball legend Magic Johnson discussed his journey with HIV and emphasized the importance of raising awareness about the virus. Diagnosed in 1991, Johnson has been an advocate for HIV AIDS research and education. He reflected on the progress made in treatment, highlighting the evolution from one drug to around 40 drug options. Johnson played a pivotal role in reducing the stigma associated with HIV by returning to professional basketball after his diagnosis. Now, at 64, he is partnering with GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, for the Sideline RSV Health Education Initiative, focusing on educating older adults about respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV. Johnson stressed the need for vaccinations and regular checkups, emphasizing his disciplined approach to staying healthy through exercise and a well-rounded lifestyle. He aims to educate others about RSV, particularly as its prevalence has increased in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is where I ask you to please make sure that you've subscribed to my channel and you've hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. Number 11, The Telegraph. Fears of hidden HIV epidemic in eastern Ukraine as war takes its toll. The Russian invasion has severely impacted the control of HIV in Ukraine, with disrupted healthcare services and shortages of testing and antiretroviral drugs. In war-torn areas like Kharkiv, where methadone supplies were cut off, drug users turned to street drugs, leading to a surge in HIV cases. The number of advanced-stage HIV cases in Kharkiv nearly doubled, indicating delayed detection and heightened AIDS risk. The situation is exacerbated in the occupied territories where HIV testing has drastically decreased, potentially fueling a silent epidemic. Concerns include the use of HIV as a weapon of war, especially in vulnerable populations like LGBT communities and women. Access to methadone and therapy services for drug users is limited, echoing the harmful consequences seen in Crimea after its annexation by Russia. While progress has been made in restoring HIV services in some parts of Ukraine, the true consequences may only be known once the war concludes. Number 12, AIDS map. The European AIDS conference revisits Warsaw. 
The European AIDS Clinic Society, EACS, is gearing up for its next conference themed It's Time to Revisit, scheduled from October 18th to 21st in Warsaw, Poland. Dr. Esteban Martinez, president of EACS, explained that the theme reflects on geography and history, marking 20 years since the last EACS conference in Warsaw in 2003. The conference aims to revisit the progress made in HIV care and prevention, particularly in Eastern Europe, acknowledging achievements and identifying persisting challenges. Given Ukraine's prominence in the region's HIV epidemic, EACS is actively addressing gaps in prevention and care related to the ongoing war. The conference will cover a range of topics, including antiretroviral therapy, comorbidities, aging, breastfeeding, HIV prevention, PrEP availability, and long-acting antiretrovirals. The emphasis is on collaborative efforts and supporting diverse communities in the fight against HIV. Number 13. Ireland Live. HIV-positive man who experienced substance abuse gains 8 kilograms in muscle and wants to be well-being coached to help others. Zachary Elliott, a 42-year-old business development consultant from Harrogate, North Yorkshire, has successfully gained 8 kilograms in muscle mass despite facing challenges like being HIV positive, autistic, ADHD, and battling substance abuse. Diagnosed with HIV in 2013 while regularly using crystal meth, he faced periods of drug abuse but decided to prioritize his health in 2021. Seeking help from a personal trainer at Ultimate Performance Leeds, Zachary has made significant progress putting on muscle and intending to become a well-being coach to assist others dealing with HIV, substance abuse, and weight management. His journey reflects resilience and determination in overcoming complex health issues. I love this story and I wanted to share it because I, of course, am a natural men's physique bodybuilder and anytime I can see someone taking care taking care of and taking control of their body and really transforming it in such a dramatic way, um, I'm happy to share that as hope and optimism for the rest of our community. Number 14, WHO Africa. Integration of HIV and SRH services yield massive results in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has seen increased demand for integrated sexual and reproductive health, also known as SRH, and HIV services through the one-stop shop concept introduced in 2020. The Ministry of Health and Child Care, with support from World Health Organization, has created centers of excellence as models for integrated service delivery. These centers offer a comprehensive package of quality family planning services, including contraceptives and HIV prevention and treatment in an environment free of stigma. The integration has led to significant improvements in healthcare quality and outcomes, with a notable increase in the screening of sexually transmitted infections and HIV testing. The success has prompted plans to expand the model to additional sites and transition to a sustainable, less donor-dependent approach. Number 15, Springer Link. Medical mistrust as a barrier to HIV prevention and care. This research article is locked away behind a paywall on Springerlink. Springerlink is an online collection of scientific, technological, and medical journals, books, and reference works. Because it's locked behind a paywall, I'm only able to share the abstract. The abstract is a short summary of an academic dissertation or research paper. So here's the abstract. Medical mistrust is fueled by conspiracy theories and histories of healthcare systems abuse and is a known determinant of health outcomes in minority populations. Plagued by multiple and pervasive conspiracy theories, HIV AIDS has proven to be particularly hampered by medical mistrust. The current paper systematically reviews the literature on medical mistrust among people at risk for or living with HIV infection. The bulk of evidence from 17 studies supports medical mistrust as a barrier to HIV testing, engagement in prevention and care services, treatment uptake and adherence, and clinical outcomes. While findings mostly indicate that medical mistrust is a barrier to HIV prevention and care, some studies report null results and others suggest that medical mistrust may actually improve some HIV-related outcomes. Additionally, most of the reviewed literature was cross-sectional. Thus, longitudinal, theory-driven research is needed to re reconcile inconsistent findings and determine long-term outcomes of medical mistrust. Interventions may then be developed to reduce the negative consequences associated with medical mistrust. This is something I would love to dive into more, but again, paywall, 
These are the things we need to ensure are accessible to community to support access and transparency of science and research for community. I see that this article was funded in part by the NIH, so I will be bringing this to their attention the next opportunity I get as part of the HOPE Collaboratory. Number 16, be in the know. Watershed moment as HIV prevention choice manifesto unveiled. Women-led groups in East and Southern Africa have released the HIV prevention choice manifesto for women and girls in Africa. The manifesto calls for political and financial support to expand women's access to various HIV prevention methods. In East and Southern Africa, women and girls account for 63% of all new HIV infections in 2022. The manifesto emphasizes the importance of providing a genuine choice in HIV prevention methods, advocating for the scale up of safe and effective options, including oral PrEP, injectable PrEP, and the PrEP vaginal ring. The call to action within the manifesto highlights five key areas emphasizing choice, prioritizing key communities, securing financing, integrating choice-based prevention into existing programs, and focusing on research and development for multi-purpose prevention options. The goal is to empower women and girls to make informed decisions about their HIV prevention methods, ensuring accessibility, affordability, and awareness. The manifesto aims to drive advocacy efforts and will be followed by a roadmap and accountability framework later in 2023. Remember folks, links to all these articles are in the description box below. Number 17, the Global Fund. Global Fund support for PrEP Ring ushers in new era for women in HIV prevention in South Africa. Three major organizations, the AIDS Foundation of South Africa, Beyond Zero and Networking HIV and AIDS Community in Southern Africa have initiated an order for 16,000 depivirane vaginal rings for HIV prevention in South Africa, supported by the Global Fund. The depivirane vaginal ring, a pre-exposure prophylaxis method, is inserted monthly in the vagina and provides long-acting localized HIV prevention. It's the only approved PrEP ring by regulatory agencies. This move expands prevention options beyond oral PrEP, addressing issues of adherence and offering a more discreet choice for women. The Global Fund hopes other countries will follow South Africa's lead, considering the revolutionary impact of the PrEP ring on HIV prevention. The ring has already been approved in several African countries, and its introduction aligns with the HIV Prevention Choice Manifesto for Women and Girls in Africa. Number 18, Medical Express. Could this new hydrogel make HIV therapy more convenient? Researchers have developed an injectable solution that self-assembles into a gel, releasing a steady dose of the anti-HIV drug lamivudine over six weeks. Unlike current methods that require daily pill regimens, this gel injected under the skin offers a potential therapy requiring only periodic injections, enhancing treatment adherence. In tests, the gel maintained effective drug concentrations for 42 days with minimal side effects in mice. The unique hydrogel system has the potential to simplify treatment regimens, improving the quality of life for individuals with HIV. The researchers aim to explore the hydrogel's applicability to combination therapies and its potential as a preventive measure in the future, hoping to eventually extend the duration of its effectiveness. Okay, so if you are in the Washington, D.C. area, Thursday, October 12th, from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., the Greater Martin Delaney Collaboratories, along with the Hope Cab, which I'm co-chair for, will be holding a free community event to give an intro to HIV cure research, answer questions, get feedback, etc. Food and drinks will be provided. It's at a place called Bus Boys and Poets. If you come by, be sure to say hi because I will definitely be there. And lastly, there is a peer educator opportunity for those living in the US. The email I received reads, we are a research team at Brown University. In our NIH sponsored study, we would like to recruit peer educators who advocate PrEP and would like to disseminate PrEP knowledge and provide PrEP education to members of their social network. This study aims to reach black African American and Hispanic Latino men who have sex with men who are most affected by HIV. Peer educators should be one on PrEP, two 18 years old, 
three have a group of black African American and Hispanic Latino men who have sex with men who can benefit from prep. Peer educators will receive a 45 minute training session and get $50 as compensation. Each peer educator can refer no more than five of their peers for free prep counseling and receive $50 for each referral. Individuals who are interested in our study, please fill in a screening survey via the link. Our study team will conduct a five minute short video call to further check the eligibility and schedule a meeting. I'll have a link to that in the description box below as well. That's it for this week. Until next time, cheers.